Um, yeah, so to start it off, I guess I'll just kind of reiterate what I was saying before about the intentions okay, for great. this. Um, yeah, I've been struggling with how to make visible the process of making an exhibition. And I found that so much of the richness actually comes from uh, the social interactions, the conversations, um, the moments leading up mm -hmm. to certain milestones as much as like the exhibition itself. Um, not that, it, I mean, obviously the exhibition is kind of this culminating big um, punctuation mark, but along the way there's, uh, there's so much meaning that mm -hmm. is generated in that space. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of been struggling with how to make that visible and legible to a public, because I think that something I think about a lot is that, um, you know, starting with art school, there's this kind of like tendency to think that I need to quickly develop a project and like launch it, finish it and start another one. Mm. Whereas my experience with the projects I love most are the ones that are durational and slow and like uh, intertwined with uh, personal relationships. And um, so part of my intention with doing this kind of conversation about the, the world around the work mm -hmm. is to, you know, maybe just show that show how this kind of process can be durational and, mm -hmm. and that not, I guess I'm interested in, in making those, that process visible mm -hmm. uh, to kind of suggest that this is not just building towards a finish. It's about the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, in this particular instance, like we have so much history that kind of led to what we eventually did in Pumice Raft. Yeah, true. I mean, it's making me think an exhibition is such a crystallization of something, you know, and thinking about crystallization, you know, those kind of like grade school experiments of like hypersaturating salt in water. Um, and then you put like thread or whatever, and then it crystallizes. So all this material that was floating in the medium, but it's invisible, is able to crystallize invisible form, you know, as, as the crystal. Mm. And an exhibit, in a way, is a crystallization of all the conversations beforehand. Uh, and each artwork in the exhibit is probably a crystallization of all sorts of other processes. But then I think what you're saying is like, once you have a crystal, how do you kind of get back to that super saturated state? You know, how do you refer backwards from the crystal to the super saturated ambience that it came from? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot to unpack in those spaces in between, mm -hmm. you know, and um, things, decisions can appear uh, like just kind of um, quick spur of the moment uh, decisions in an exhibition, but to kind of peel back the social context, I think is, is illuminating. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've actually been thinking about curating as like kind of a documentary practice or like an archival practice mm. that, it, or at least that's how I've been thinking about it. And that it's, it's how to make leg legible, like an artist practice, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, whether it's mm -hmm. in a new way or whether it's in a way that's like in, in service of, um, you know, their practice historically or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, that, that these kind of mediums are helpful for that pursuit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm even thinking just of our glasses on the table and then being documented in a conversation happening around them. It really makes me think of those Daniel Spoeri um, annotated, what are they called? Topologies of chance. Mm. I might have gotten the title wrong, but you know, he did these paintings that are tabletops where he glued down everything that was on a tabletop after a dinner or a conversation or a meal or a drinking and smoking. Um, and then the book work that he made is annotating the recollections of each cigarette butt, each glass, each kind of cork of wine bottles. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of what you're talking about is kind of getting back to the 
uh, super saturated ambience on the evidence, the supporting evidence of the crystallized materials, mm. you know, and yeah, like, uh, as you said, like, how do you, how do you balance both of those dimensions? Um, especially when we tend to prioritize the finished artwork, the finished exhibition as the thing. Um, how do we attend to the thing while referring to the ambience from which that thing emerged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how have you uh, approached these questions in your practice, like prior to our collaboration? I mean, this is something that Chris and I talk about a lot. Um, you know, and so much of Chris's work deals with that fairly explicitly. So kind of those clay sculptures that are fired and glazed but the glaze looks like unfired wet clay um, as a way to kind of point to the state of the material before it was fixed in the oven, um, in the kiln. Um, so kind of the, the finished object refers to its unfinished state beforehand, you know, um, and his play in the dark room also kind of animates those things. Um, I don't know. It's, it, I guess it, maybe it's harder for me to talk about my own work in that way, but like, um, I do have a sense that it's the interconnection between things that is the thing, you know? Um, and so through what gestures, um, modes of association can we connect to that? level of experience you know the albums are very much like that right yeah. like it's a collection of images but it's kind of the ever shifting ever multiplying associations that we make between images that's where the album narrative comes yeah yeah the i i feel like my way of saying what you're saying is i often think of uh that art happens as opposed to it's made, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like uh, whether in, in a direct way, in a painting where like the, the, that, that gap is pretty uh, small between what is made and where the art uh, happens or uh, within a social context um, where, you know, an artist or a curator may set up a series of conditions which are then animated mm. um, by people that animation is where the art happens. Mm -hmm. And I think of the albums in a similar way where you have these uh, combinations or juxtapositions of images which then kind of coalesce or allow something to emerge, which, yeah, which is what I would kind of consider mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. art emerging. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, thinking about form follows fiction, like, you know, it, it, it ends with this figure of the ventriloquist, the ventriloquist and the ventriloquist dummy, where you're, who's speaking, right? Like, in a way, you need the alibi of the dummy for the ventriloquist to speak um, by pretending that it's the dummy who speaks. Um, and so, so that's a kind of gesture of showing that there's an, something else uh, past the thing that is visible or obvious or presented or exhibited. You know, we need that thing, but it doesn't end at that thing. You know, the thing should be the opportunity to go past it, you know. And in a way, we can say, like, all of art, I think, has to take that form. Um, that's a general claim, but I, I do believe that. Yeah, the uh, thinking of the ventriloquist and the dummy uh, makes me think of something I think about a lot, which is like often to get to truth, you have to pass through illusion, mm. you know, like mm -hmm. that, that, um, and actually, um, I don't know if it's jumping in too much, mm -hmm. but I yeah, would like to talk about a few of the uh, works in that way, actually. Um, I'm trying to think of the best one to speak about. Maybe this one. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually a couple views. Mm -hmm. I remember we were in the gallery one time and you were talking about that the lines allow for a symbolic space to emerge. That the lines themselves uh, aren't the kind of ending 
you know, of course they do operate uh, under an aesthetic, um, you know, their aesthetic uh, in their arrangement and, and uh, inscription, but that they, they're kind of the catalyst for this other thing to emerge a different form of space. I wonder if you could talk maybe a bit about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's interesting to think about drawing as an activity that people do, you know, making a line that then suggests something by means of that line, right? Even like a stick figure, you know, it suggests a body. Um, and depending on how you draw that stick figure, that body can have a character, can have a gesture, can have a mood, can have a, you know, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and even the subtlest change of a line could kind of change the, the character of the thing you're drawing. Um, and, and that happens even in abstract drawings, like the, the pendulum drawing here. Um, you know, I don't know, at this scale right now, I'm looking at kind of, to me, it makes me think of like dust bunnies under the bed or, <laughs> or like, um, what are they called? Those weeds that kind of... Oh, tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds, you know, or like um, a kind of knotted, like um, um, barbed wire, kind of a, a tangle of barbed wire. You know, that's what I'm seeing kind of at this scale. Like, obviously, when we're looking at the drawing, there's other associations. Um, I remember when we were in the gallery talking about um, those uh, particle colliders um, and those drawings or images of like subatomic particles that happen when you kind of smash um, particles together in an accelerator um, and how these are kind of, and then they, then they become a kind of trace or a record or a map of this particle that you can't observe on its own, you know? And so thinking about the, the pendulum drawings has, you know, a, a movement of two forces interacting with each other, which it's itself too much to comprehend, but we have the, the trace it leaves as the thing through which we have access to that kind of complexity or that kind of interaction, push-pull, mutuality. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, which makes me think of uh, the hand drawing. We were talk we've talked a lot about palm reading, mm -hmm. which kind of has a similar uh, ability um, where it reads meaning into form. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it illuminates uh, a different understanding of the thing than it, how it is depicted. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about these, and I'm so glad that we were able to kind of select them and isolate them for the show at Pumice Raft and kind of consider them again. You know, so they're like painted in 93. Then they were in the Mocha show, I think in 2010. And now we can see them again in 2022. So, you know, they keep coming back is the point. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how I keep thinking of, of something like this, something that kind of slides, something that used to be understood as a single thing. And then it goes through a process which slides from itself and it becomes split to itself. Um, and, but it's the sliding that I'm kind of thinking about right now. Um, you know, that's active in so many ways in each of the drawings, but also in the, the relationship between the two drawings. Like thinking about the, the graph paper that was already pre-printed with blue lines. And there's a blue pen acting on the pre-printed blue line. So that's already a kind of not a redundancy, but a kind of echo of what was there so that we can pay attention to what was there in a, in a changed form. Um, 
and then those blue lines, the, the pen lines, are depicting another set of lines, which are the existing lines on the hand that's not doing the drawing. Mm. So there's already a kind of like sliding between the two hands, right? The hand that's making line, drawn lines of the other hand that's not drawing but contains lines of its own. Um, and then some of the, you know, the drawing has a kind of like Cezanne quality where he kind of creates a volume of, I don't know, an apple or a mountain. He creates a volume by paying attention to the edges of the thing mm. rather than the body of the thing. And through paying attention very carefully to all of the borders of a thing, that's enough to suggest the volume without kind of painting the volume. Mm. And so there's something like that happening in this drawing where there's certain kind of, there's a lot of like empty space um, where hand and background kind of are merged, but there's enough kind of delineation of the hand to kind of suggest something. Um, and then as we jump from this drawing to this drawing, which was made, I don't know, I guess like four months later or whatever, you know, the representational gestures of these blue lines slide away from the representational function into non-representational function as just lines as such. Um, but they still seem to kind of talk, you know, there's, I guess it's kind of what we're talking about, the crystallization, like, in this case, it's more like an abstraction going on, but that abstraction still refers to the thing that it, it is an abstraction of. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know why this experience of this kind of sliding or like de detaching, <laughs> self detaching uh, is so interesting to me. There, I don't know why, but um, that was, I think, activated very much in the Pumas Raft show with the wall treatment that you came up with, you know, keeping the walls white and half of the walls this kind of um, neutral tone. Mm. Um, and it, in a sense, it was painted arbitrarily in the sense that there's like a halfway point of the, each wall decided, you know, what was being painted. Um, but then when we installed everything, um, the framed artworks landed in an arbitrary place along, yeah, along that painted dividing line. Mm -hmm. And so there was a weird sense of, well, very much like this, the pre-printed paper, the architectural given of the gallery, which was m indicated by this halfway point of each wall. So it's just, you know, drawing attention to the architectural given. But then there's a new given, which is the installation of the artworks superimposed on the walls. And then those two orders don't match. Mm -hmm. And in their non-matching, there was this amazing feeling that the frame pictures on the wall were kind of like sliding across the wall rather than sitting on the wall. You know, it, it, it was impossible to capture that feeling in images, but it was very present in the gallery space. That when you're looking at one of the drawings or the triptych or whatever, um, and as you're mindful of this line kind of on, on the edge of your vision, there's a sense that like all the frameworks were kind of like doing the slow motion <laughs> sliding across the wall rather mm. than sitting on the wall. Um, that was really remarkable. Like I think that I wouldn't have been able to predict that from the wall treatment, but it speaks to some of the things that I was talking about in, you know, that are happening in the line drawings. Um, I don't know if that relates to like augury or, you know, divination of like, I don't know, your future or whatever. But um, I guess you mentioned it in terms of kind of like the desire for meaning and the construction of meaning from an arbitrary sign. Um, and I spoke about it more in terms of kind of like the detaching of the given from itself. And that creates enough gap 
that then that becomes a kind of possibility for meaning, you know? Mm. Yeah, when you were talking about the tension between the pre-existing lines and the lines that you've mm -hmm. added, um, that made me think of uh, a, a lot of conversations that I had with people about the the ledger drawings mm -hmm. and and really all the drawings which ha which are on a pre-existing kind of gridded paper, but that the 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 pendulum the intervention you had with the pendulum really hinges on the pre-existing uh, mm -hmm. structure of the grid mm -hmm. that especially with how you've kind of almost matched the the pen color with the gr the color of the grid mm -hmm. there is this sense of uh breaching mm -hmm. you know breaching what was already there which makes you know makes, makes me think of the borderline case the, these moments kind of like mm -hmm. kind of like the the moments where the framed works go over the the painted lines but that there's this the tension there between uh the abstract and the I don't know, the kind of linearity of mm -hmm. the grid mm -hmm. um, feels like something that is sprinkled throughout the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like it's, yeah, so it's true. This drawing has blue and black ballpoint pens uh, drawn on top of paper that's been pre-printed blue and red. So the red is not duplicated, so it, it only exists in the pre-printed ledger grid. But the blue exists in two moments, in the pre-printed ledger grid, but also in the pendulum drawing. And so those two blues start to talk to each other. Uh, and then there's the black pendulum drawing, which is also like the red on an independent register. But the blue and the black pendulum drawings are close enough in tone that the eye mistakes them easily. Mm. So even though the black is independent, it has a kind of breach, as you say. It kind of bleeds into something else. Um, you know, and in, like in this drawing, the pendulum, there are moments where the pendulum drawings are trying to obey the pre-existing grid of the ledger so you know there's this area where the blue pendulum lines are trying to echo the pre-printed ledger the blue pre-printed lines here that's that obeyance is not happening um, largely that's not happening in this drawing except that there's a, a third register of line that asserts itself which is the fold in the ledger paper, right? When it was bound, it was a, a sheet of paper that had been folded together and then bound in a book. In that crack, that fold line asserts itself when it interrupts the pen of the pendulum drawing. And so there are moments where the pen kind of gets caught in the gutter of that fold line and it can't move to the other side. And so those moments of kind of resistance or something register as this kind of invisible line, which is the fold. Um, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, as we speak, I can't help but think of Mondrian. Like, you know, everything of Mondrian is essentially this. Like, it's all about creating artworks that present the interplay of elements which are experienced to be existing in the same object and therefore in the same plane. But as you experience the object, the, the painting or whatever, you realize that the forms participate in different ways at different registers, you know? So, um, a black line in his kind of classic, you know, Mondrian paintings. The black line operates on a register of um, black and not black, so the white areas of the of the painting. 
um, or the colored areas of the painting, the blue, the yellow, the red. Um, but at the same time, it operates as line versus plane, you know? So, so the red that used to be the other of the black line, because that red is also a line, as lines, they actually are the same thing, you know, looked at from a different register, mm. a different kind of position on the part of the viewer. And that activation happens all over the place, but it continues beyond the frame of the painting, you know, like there's ways in which some forms kind of wrap over the edge of the painting and some don't. And the way he would frame his paintings the frame didn't really coincide with the painting. It kind of like receded. And then there was a frame to the frame and sometimes a frame to the frame to the frame. And then you have wall. And then the wall becomes like an active participant um, through this kind of very psychedelic, very fractal experience of uh, complex, multi-layer, multi-register interactions. Um, this sounds really kind of abstract and obtuse, but it's, it's very much experiential. You know, when you're standing in front of the work, it's a dynamic that's just happening before your eyes. You don't have to theorize it the way I'm mm. trying to do that, I'm trying to do now. Um, so it's interesting to hear myself speak about these words and then really realize like, oh, I mean, this is from my kind of, I guess, study of Mondrian when, when I was, I don't know when, 24 or whatever, mm -hmm. like thinking about kind of this crazy artist. Yeah, the, the frame, framing the frame makes me think a lot about mm -hmm. the inclusion of uh, mm -hmm. the Sphinx in mm -hmm. the exhibition. And mm -hmm. it was interesting to talk to people as they, they came in, because um, the question, Inevitably, as they kind of moved through the framed works on the wall that are line-based, they'd arrive at the Sphinx and then kind of uh, ask the question, you know, how does this relate? Mm -hmm. and, and I would always kind of return to the, the lines breaching the grid mm -hmm. as a framing device in itself. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, obviously the gesture of the Sphinx is this kind of uh, framing of the world that it attempts to see as a headless uh, being. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk a bit about that. That um, I think framing runs through your practice as kind of a, a major concern or, or something you, you think about a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's interesting because often I've been, when people talk to me about my interest in frames, often I get a kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, a pushback that frames are somehow trying to put things in a prison, <laughs> you know, that, that I'm obsessed with putting something in a box um, and that that must be resisted. So that's the pushback. It's a resistance against what's perceived to be my desire to put things in boxes or imprison them. Um, but I see frames very differently. I don't see them as prisons or boxes. They're more, they're more kind of how we've spoken about these things is the frame might be real, but nevertheless, it has a capacity to act as a breach, act as a kind of sliding zone, act as a kind of thing that, um, counterintuitively or perversely um, unframes something, you know? It's kind of like, um, you know, like there's like fairy tales or something, like you can have everything you want, um, just don't ask for what's in this box. Don't ask for what's in this envelope. So of course the only thing you want is the thing in the envelope, right? Uh, in a, so in a way, it's the frame, the, f the, the, the forbidden nature of that frame in that 
situation. Rather than create a zone of unthought um, elsewhereness, it actually activated the desire um, to transgress it, you know, and um, I guess that's why I called it perverse or, or counterintuitive that, um, yeah. So, I mean, in a way, like, yeah, seeing the drawings, the frame, the way the drawing interacts with the frame, the way the frame interacts with the wall, which has the wall painting, that's now taking us from the art, from the artwork to the architecture and the Sphinx similar identically it's taking us from the architecture to the world you know mm -hmm. and making a kind of frame but also making a zone of potential slides um and that's very much what you talked about right at the beginning of the conversation right doing exhibitions that point to the process from which they came those conversations that social aspect I mean, that's the same gesture or same desire towards a frame, that you create an exhibition, which is a frame. It has an opening date and a closing date. But for you, the desire to create that frame is precisely to point to all the things beyond that frame while also attending to what's in the frame of the exhibit. Um, so in a way, the Sphinx is performing um, as an allegory or something like that. You know, your own attitude to what it means to do an exhibition um, by pointing to the space um, beyond the exhibition itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and by also showing the kind of mm, mutability that can happen between those two registers, hence the headlessness, right? If there was a head, it would have a kind of fixed point of view from which the view happens. So it, it would be from the inside to the outside. But its headlessness kind of makes it undecidable which is the starting place and which is the destination place. It could go in any direction, hmm. right? That's the fantasy, at least. Hmm. Or that's the, the, the enigma of the, of the Sphinx. Yeah, reflecting on, it's, it's been exhibited three times, right? In, mm -hmm. in Montreal um, for the biennial there. Um, in Allen Gardens for Nuit Blanche mm -hmm. and now in this space. Could you, I, I would be interested to hear your reflections on how it operates mm. differently or uh, surprising overlaps mm -hmm. between those three contexts because they all, all are fairly mm -hmm. unique from mm -hmm. each other. True. You know, what an interesting question. Like, yeah, so when it was first shown at Allen Gardens at Nuit Blanche, I presented it with the vitrine tables containing uh, the first iteration of my library of Toronto publications. So the Sphinx was kind of an emblem for a kind of desire, historical desire to talk about Toronto or depict Toronto or, or publish something about Toronto. So it, it was a kind of Toronto mascot or something. Um, it was also in the context of a greenhouse. So it's a space of cultivation inside a public park. So park is a kind of cultivated nature and the greenhouse in the park is the zone of cultivation. And so it kind of the the sphinx was kind of the keystone that held together two zones right like toronto as a place and its narratives and then the the notion of cultivation and even the notion of a garden you know that becomes like a a theme in in so many works right including this right the, the this idea of the um the the things that emerge from the carpet world on the ground. Um, so that's the first iteration of the Sphinx. It kind of thought about what it takes to cultivate an idea of place in Toronto. And then it went to Montreal, where it was in a, in a very grand atrium space at the Museum of Contemporary Art. 
Um, and I decided to install it on a fairly tall plinth. So it became, it kind of talked to the very tall ceiling in that space. And it kind of became a bit of like um, a jerk, I, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, it kind of became a bit of a, a heroic statue. Um, that was a kind of... Um, I don't know, Colossus or something like that, that welcomed people into the exhibition, this biennial. Um, so it kind of became tied to the museum as a place. And the way it was tied to a museum was as a kind of Colossus figure that was a kind of welcoming sculpture, but also a bit of like a, like a jerk um, um, it was a heavy object to see first. Mm. Um, so it had a funny presence that rather than connecting a greenhouse and cultivation of narratives of place in Toronto was now about kind of the grand space of the museum in the context of a biennial and serving as a kind of figuration of something. Um, the, the biennial was curated under the premise, the Le Grand Balcon, so the, the grand balcony, I guess. Mm. So it kind of thought about the balcony from which you view things in a space that is both inside and outside. And so the sculpture made a lot of sense, I think, within the curatorial premise. Um, and then finally, at, at Pumas Raft, I'm tempted to say that it return, it leaves the museum um, to the artist-run center. Uh, so we're not in the greenhouse anymore. We're not in the museum anymore. We're in the artist-run center. Um, and I think it's just just less of a jerk. Um, you know, he's got this cute little bomb. Like it, it's it's a lot less assertive because we see it from behind. Um, and it's also looking around the neighborhood. Um, it's a funny one. I'm trying to think like if at one point, yeah, so here it's a bit of a, of a voyeur, <laughs> of, a, of a selfie, of someone taking a selfie of themselves, caught unawares. Um, it's a kind of, I don't know. It's framing, to me at least, it's framing as much uh, the world beyond the gallery as it is um, the space within, you know, like mm -hmm. it's really calling out mm -hmm, um, true. to the neighborhood. And I think that that's like mm -hmm. such a, I often like to engage with the window for that reason, because it has, uh, you know, it's it, the situatedness of Pamas Raft is so kind of essential to mm -hmm. its existence. Mm -hmm. And I think that in particular, uh, the Sphinx um, did that kind of call and response mm -hmm. to the world beyond its own world. Mm -hmm. True. And it's interesting because it probably only can do that after hours, like when the gallery is closed and it's dark out, but light inside the space, only then can it appear to passersby. So I did think often, you know, because there's that kind of park area nearby where people walk their dogs. And I was, I was imagining what would someone think who lives in the neighborhood is going out for a walk with their dog and then sees this kind of weird um, topless figure, headless figure, uh, you know, l looking up um, with this kind of, not binocular, but kind of um, cy cyclops <laughs> binocular, <laughs> like a one eye thing. Um, where does one p 
put that vision? Like if I'm walking my dog and I see that, where do I put it? <laughs> you know, there's no obvious place to put it. There's no obvious thing like, oh, this is that. I know where to put it. It would just be a weird thing. It would be a kind of <laughs> yeah. sphinx, this like mysterious, like what does it mean? What is it trying to do? Um, it kind of returns to that idea of the perverse in a way, mm -hmm. I think, you know, like this disruptor. Um, cause even when, you know, this, you see it illuminated, uh, but I, I have, I have a picture of the lights off at night oh, yeah. and the gl the glow of the white, uh, the marble dust resin, mm. it's still, uh, legible. Oh, amazing. And in that sense, it's almost like this, um, ghostly figure. And, mm. and so, yeah, that just makes me think back to this idea of, uh, of the, the way you were talking about the perverse um, aspect of the work in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the perverse as being this kind of like sliding, this kind of um, tendency to self-detach and see what happens, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the borderline mm -hmm. case, um, being well, this, these are like nice together. Like that is nice. Um, yeah, the borderline case being this tension between the vacant lot and the tangled garden mm -hmm. um, is kind of central to both the exhibition at Pumice Raft, but also uh, the the parrot exhibition at Patel Brown. Maybe you could talk a bit of, about those those two concepts and their relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the phrase borderline case because it suggests something, but it's hard to know what it's suggesting. Um, it suggests a kind of clinical something, <laughs> like a symptom of something, um, but it also treats it as a case. It treats it as a, a kind of um, like a case study, like something that you don't have to kind of get stuck on. It's something that you're considering as a case study. <laughs> um, you know, it kind of lets us off the hook while we think about what a borderline case is because it's just like an example. It's just a model. It's just a... Um, a hypothetical case study. Um, you know, in, in clinical psychiatry or, or psychoanalysis, a borderline case is um, someone who's in a state between uh, psychosis and neurosis. Right? Someone who's not fully neurotic, nor fully psychotic, um, there's a designation of someone's in a borderline um, situation, um, which I'm, I imagine would be extremely pla painful place to be. Um, uh, you know, and something about the lines, I don't know, they, they, right now they're starting to kind of read as a kind of lie detector or an MRI or I don't know, <laughs> some kind of like um, hospital kind of device to read life signs or something like this. Um, but in the text that I'm writing for the book work that we've been talking about for a while now, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I consider three borderline cases, um, which are three moments of detaching, I guess. Three moments where one publication happens and then a subsequent publication um, is created to become a kind of echo or boomerang to the first publication. And so suddenly those, the existence of the second publication creates a gap that can generate meaning. Um, so, so the title kind of has all these references, plus it also indicates kind of the idea of the line. So 
the drawings and their lines, but even the paintings are kind of created by a kind of line work. Um, so it was, um, uh, the title I think was a kind of crystallization of some of these kinds of things that I was thinking about. But also the, yeah, the, the return to, you know, returning back to uh -huh. form follows fiction. Mm -hmm. um, you did explore the tangled garden and the vacant lot yeah. kind of uh, centrally within this book. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like, how, how did those concepts, like, continue to evolve for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely do continue to evolve. Uh, I mean, you know, like we talked about the tat, like sliding. I mean, this is an amazing <laughs> image of sliding uh, something that used to be one becoming more than one. Um, yeah, I mean, these do that so well. Uh, I mean, well, yeah, I guess this is a borderline case, <laughs> you know, like... Um, So, okay, in relation to the Tangle Garden and the Vacant Lot, really trying to think about um, about what are some of the patterns, the literary tropes, so to speak, that are time and time again adopted when people in different contexts at different times have something to say about Toronto. And so one of the recurring tropes that I observed, or well, two of the recurring tropes is the idea of the Tangled Garden, so the J.E.H. McDonald painting, um, and the idea of the vacant lot. Um, both of these kind of figures, so here's a good one, right? The public studio representation of the Toronto Purchase Treaty, which, depicts the site where Toronto will be as a kind of vacant lot, as an empty rectangle to be drawn or imagined um, on the landscape. Um, obviously, it ties, that effort is tied to colonization. I, I, you know, I, I was talking to you earlier that um, since the first... COVID lockdown, I decided to kind of learn about psychoanalysis. I've been, you know, going down the rabbit hole of, of learning about different figures in psychoanalysis and stuff like that. And recently I've been thinking about Lacan and someone who's like supposed to be quite hard to understand, and I'm sure he is. Um, but something kind of clicked for me recently. Um, and um, just in terms of like borderline cases and things like that, like, or, or this idea of the, the kind of sliding, um, you know, the, the idea of the, the sliding signifier is very important for Lacan, right? That, um, that our unconscious is not like a, a deep pit in which we store all the nasty bits that we don't want to think about. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a metaphor like that. It's not a, a deep, dark place where you push all the stuff. Um, for him, the unconscious is totally on the surface, totally, it's, there's nothing dark or hidden about it. Um, and yet, nevertheless, it's un, it's, it is unconscious. But it's unconscious because the process by which it's structured is one of constant sliding, right? Um, one thing slides to be another thing and another thing and another thing. So that's what makes it unconscious. It's, it's kind of sliding nature, um, which makes it hard to pinpoint or something like that. Um, and just to go back to this idea of the double, I was trying to think, so I'm teaching a class at U of T on critical theory and I've got a, I'm putting together a reading list and all that stuff. And there's a kind of concept from Lacan that I really want to use, the concept of uh, afterwardsness. 
you know, which is derived from a kind of Freudian idea. Um, I'm probably going to misquote it, but it goes something like, um, I can't remember exactly the original Freud quote, but it's something to the effect of um, there where the unconscious was, I am to be or something like that. It's, it's totally bungled, but, but the structure is the relevant part that I'm trying to indicate. Um, there where X was, Y will have been, right? And so there's this weird temporal thing where will have been indicates that in the future it will come about, but in the future it will come about as having been there all along in the past. So that's afterwardsness, right? Like the emergence of the second retroactively makes the first the first. Like the first by itself wasn't anything. It's only through the emergence of the second that retroactively the first becomes the first. You know, it's a very subtle notion, but a very useful one to think about things like conscious and unconscious and other things. Um, and so I was trying to think of a way to talk about this to second year undergrad students without kind of, you know, sounding loopy. <laughs> um, and it occurred to me that like baby language is kind of like that, you know, like a baby is making all sorts of sounds that don't signify to us. They're kind of like baby gibberish. Until the moment that the baby repeats a sound, right? And then you have like mama, papa, kaka. Then now you have a word. Now it's not sounds or gibberish or non-signifying things. Now you have signification, right? Um, it's funny, it's interesting that baby sounds are doubles, that they're repetitions. They're like, you know, mama, papa. Um, um, and, but, but it's interesting, I think it's tempting to think that mama or papa was the word. That it's one word. That it's one utterance. But actually it has the effect of an, of a, of, of an afterwardsness. It's a ma that at that moment is still gibberish, but it's with the arrival of the second ma that then the first ma is not gibberish, but the first half of a word called mama, right? But that only happened backwards. Like hmm. in the first ma, there was no guarantee that there was going to be a word. But once there's a word, the word was already always there. Right? That's the idea of the afterwards. And it says, once you have the word completed, it's as if the word was always, always there for the baby. Um, and then I was thinking about how does that happen for the baby? You know, it's probably like seeing people signify stuff to each other in a way that, as a baby, I don't really understand. <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> talking, there's emotions flowing back and forth from person to person. I can see that. But I don't know who they are, what they mean, what they're saying. I just know there's a kind of economy and a commerce between people that I'm participating, but participating in the mode of a mystery. Um, you know, and I'm trying to participate. So I'm making all these stabs at words that don't end up meaning anything because they take it as gibberish. Until I say mama. And then one of the women in the room gets all excited. And she's like, you said your first word and I was your first word? Oh my God, baby, I love you so much. <laughs> so for the baby, I'm like, wait, I just did something and I just got a whole um, uh, investment of emotion. I made this person really excited and really happy, you know. And then I made the papa probably a little bit mixed emotions like <laughs> what wasn't I the first word you know like I'm happy you're talking baby but I wish you had said papa too you know so anyway um I think this is something about kind of this idea of the double and the repetition but also that there's a certain afterwardsness at play 
in it. It's not simply like there is an original and then there's a copy. I think Toronto artists and literary people and cinema people have been very attuned to the idea that it's never as simple as that. <laughs> you know, that kind of situations of like undecidability or sliding or confusion or uncanniness are always at play and those things can be mobilized to say something meaningful about what it's like to be here mm. um, you know I do think Toronto is a place that's that presents a bit of a, a sphinx for us right like um, Yeah, it's hard to see. Toronto's hard to see, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when you're in it. You know, it doesn't have a hill that you get to grasp Toronto. Ah, that's that thing called Toronto. It doesn't have, but, and yet, it's full of hills, but they go down. They're the ravines. So our hill, hills, which are no, n normally the place that you get a vantage point that allows you to objectify the place you're in and say, that's what it looks like. We don't have that here. But we do have hills, but our hills go down rather than up into the ravines. Which is to say they don't provide a point of view from which to objectify. Rather, they provide a point of view from in which to be immersed. The opposite of objectification. Mm. That's a funny situation to be in. That's a funny place to be in. And I think some of these tropes become, have been discovered as useful tropes to indicate something about this place. That's really interesting. Yeah, that, uh, it's funny, this discussion of psychoanalysis reminds me of uh, another visit I had to uh, the gallery from a Freudian psycho psychoanalyst. Mm. Oh yeah. And, um, and he talked a lot about the idea mm -hmm. of the doodle mm -hmm. um, as a form of, you know, unpacking meaning within a psychoanalytic context. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of the works in the exhibition, um, they're best seen in the first five or ten minutes of seeing them. Mm -hmm. Because it's within that space that the brain is able to like kind of exist in that mm -hmm. in that middle zone mm -hmm. that it feels like you're talking about mm -hmm. um, before it starts to assign pattern mm -hmm. meaning totally, structure totally. Um, as a mode of self preservation, mm -hmm. and that that the, that the doodle like the uh, the uh, unintentional or, or uh, improvisational line is a catalyst for that kind of in-between space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and... Yeah, and yeah, and then the question, I think, for an artist becomes, like, how do you extend that five minutes? <laughs> you know, how do you make that maybe six minutes? You know, how do you make that zone of non-signification non-defensive attribution to meaning last a little longer and not and when it when it's over how do you make it, that door not close completely right when i look at toronto culture and i try to look at different things not just one type of thing i hit upon this insistently so I think there's something about it, this, an intelligence of this place that has arrived at a certain idea that that, precisely that difficult thing, is the thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, I'm just trying to, to find, like, the, the, the ventriloquist story. So, yeah, it ends... So, yeah, after 170 pages, uh, the essay, the curatorial essay that I wrote ends. Um, actually, I'll go to the previous par paragraph. Form follows fiction is not a history, but it does propose some of the reference points on which histories can coalesce and be debated some of the grounding patterns on which historical accounts can be constructed and deconstructed. Q 
curatorial care does not attempt to smooth over the schisms, correct the fault lines, or disentangle the puzzle presented by Toronto's culture. Care aims to connect the dots in patterns that stimulate and energize what gives the puzzle its inherent value. In this period, it's perhaps best to let another speak the concluding words. And then I quote this passage from Gordon Lebret. To speak from the belly, as it were, to ventriloquize, to throw one, one's voice, not from a source close by itself, but rather from a place where one is not, a dummy place, dummy site. Everything then will have been less a demonstration than an unfolding of the margins of such a presentation or exposition, what I will call its mise-en-scene or media. The vent, the one who stands behind the vent figure, the one who pulls the strings, must accommodate himself to two scripts, two voices, two bodies, at the same time that he must not reveal the trick. The event or showing which marks the coming alive of the event figure, the opening to what is properly the event figure's own, is the occasion for reviewing both semblance, a showing of something as something it is not, and appearance, a showing of something that in turn shows something extra, something beyond itself, but which elects for not showing itself. Each utterance, each word is double voiced, is authored by at least two sources. You know, I mean, so that's, you know, you have to systematize in the form of a riddle. You know, you have to be able to, or what I would like to do is, if systematizing something is what I'm interested in, um, then I would try to do so in the form of um, a thing that maintains what made the puzzle um, so alive and relevant, mm -hmm. right? Rather than defensively close it off into a signification that then we can just kind of get hung up on. So one of the things that was such a pleasure about this whole ex experience is um, getting a better understanding of mm. of your entire uh, catalog of works. You know, we visited one of your uh, mm -hmm. one of a few mm -hmm. storage mm -hmm. lockers, um, and uh, you know, just being able to see the first self portrait mm -hmm. you painted, mm -hmm. or uh, these works, which you know, you were how old, nineteen, twenty, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, being able to like glimpse that practice. Um, how have you kind of, what strategies have you used to kind mm. of make the overarching principles or, or reoccurring ideas legible mm -hmm. to a public? I think I do believe in the use value of a bit of sand in the Vaseline. You know, um, My previous solo show prior to these borderline cases in Toronto uh, was the project for the Toronto Biennial, you know, where I worked with the collection of maps, the collection of books, and a series of photographs. Um, I love that project. Um, and I realized from seeing how it worked with audiences is that people really got stuck at the level of the signifier. You know, they really got stuck on like, oh, what does this map represent? Oh, who published this book? Or, you know, it was, people got stuck at the level of identifying, you know, because these objects are about identifying. Um, and the gaps in the, in the, in the work, um, I think people didn't know what to do with. Uh, which is fine. I'm, I'm, that's what those guys are for. Um, but I did decide my next show has to not take the root of the signifier. It has to be on not take the root of identification. Um, 
happily you were very much into that idea and you know we're able to put this together um so that's kind of what i mean about a bit of sand in the vaseline like i could have gone on a kind of signifying and identifying and then i would have louis would have become the artist whose work is about this the artist who oh he's the guy that does this um that's great. I mean, that there's a certain efficiency in being that kind of an artist. But when you ask about my strategies, I, I've all long believed that there's a use value to putting a bit of sand in the works because that creates certain frictions and certain sparks that are much more interesting to me than the smooth functioning of things. Uh, so that's one strategy. I think another strategy is the use value of just oddity of odd things <laughs> you know like of something that you're like what the hell <laughs> um you know it might not give you even as much as five minutes but even asking the question what the hell is indicates a kind of lingering and a kind of um you know, there's the fish hook has kind of grabbed onto something in the mind. Um, so the use value of oddity. Um, and I think like you, I believe in a kind of intertextuality. In making sure that I connect the dots within my own practice. I connect the dots between myself and other people and so on. I connect the dots between myself and other artists, form follows fiction, for example. So not that it's all me connecting all the dots, because I mean, we're all doing that. So it's just kind of plugging into a certain kind of process and, and activating that. But, but yeah, definitely working in such a way that it's not about kind of expression, like, this is me and I have something to say and I say it. Um, I've never understood that as being relevant to artistic practice. Mm. Um, it's more connecting the dots. You are saying something, but it's, it's not so... It doesn't take the metaphor of like, I have an inner truth and I'm going to take it out and show it to you. It's more there are points and and how do we navigate how do we uh entwine and entangle and disentangle ourselves with, among these points and then in that process i think things happen mm -hmm. you know in that process as you said like uh things get activated and they come alive uh, the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is you mentioned it briefly about you connecting the dots mm -hmm. to to those around you, whether it be artists or writers or just people in the community. And I wanted to bring this out as a, this is the first kind of evidence of our collaboration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the aspects of your practice that I appreciate the most is uh, the importance you place on um, intergenerational dialogue, dialogue in general, um, uh, uplifting those around you through your own activities. Um, I wonder. I wonder if you could just talk a bit about your experiences with that. Like I know that y you've we've talked about some of those formative experiences where you were on the receiving end of that mm -hmm. and how that becomes part of a practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really makes me think about artists around culture, you know, like there are many types of culture, um, but one of them is artists around culture. Um, and it's so interesting. I mean, like uh, the, the idea of art is one culture is so interesting. Um, something that I think about is, you know, cultures need ways of reproducing themselves. You know, so I don't know. Canadian culture 
can reproduce itself through uh, classrooms in which Canadian history, Canadian literature, stuff like that is taught. So that's a form of cultural reproduction, right? Um, Artist-run culture is funny because there's no school that you can take a course on artist-run uh, culture that will reproduce the culture. So artist-run culture is interesting because it, um, it doesn't have at it, uh, its disposal many of the normal means of cultural reproduction. Um, and so how does a certain continuity from generation to generation, how does knowledge reproduce itself so that when one generation is gone, the, other gen the next generation can keep going that culture? Um, you know, we've been talking about Toronto and like, you know, there's some publications, which is really great, but there's also a sense that um, that these publications don't do the role of cultural reproduction that we expect of publications. Um, and yet knowledge is still passed on. Like, um, you know, I remember in high school doing a zine, Salmon Hut, and I became really interested in zines and found the G.B. Jones and Bruce LeBruce, who were doing JDs and kind of got involved with them. Um, so I kind of understood zine culture. And then by the time I walked into Art Metropole, I knew what I was seeing. Like, I, you know, for me it was zines. I mean, it's not zines literally, but it's that kind of culture, right? Once I walked into Art Metropole, I understood what they were doing. Um, and then, of course, I learned about general idea and all this other stuff through our metropole. Um, and then I started doing things like zines and things for our, like to be distributed at our, our metropole. And then at a certain point, AA invited me to join the board, and I joined the board for many years. And so I feel like that's a kind of uh, instance of a certain social reproduction, cultural reproduction, that wasn't just about artists on culture reproducing itself, but how it interfaced with other types of culture, zine culture in this instance. And then that gave me a certain kind of cultural understanding so that then I understood what's happening in this realm of culture called artists on culture. And then through that, I meet somebody like you and then you know, you have your set of references, I have my set of references, but there's enough um, overlap that even if we don't fully understand each other's frame of references, we're different generations, there's enough overlap that we know what the other's saying, the substance of things we know what we're, the essence of things we know what we're talking about. Um, also, we're both nerds, like we're both, um, <laughs> We love objects, we love finding an object, we like once we find the object, taking care of it, <laughs> you know? There's a certain kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, like affect, even eros around the object, the archival object, the, the preserved object that we both share and I think we kind of, we can talk about things from that perspective. Um, I don't know, and for me, like, so, so there's something personal. Like, I think you, you and I talking, there's a lot of overlaps in our personalities, our interests, and stuff like this. Even if our generational experience, our set of references are not 100% matched, certain core things are, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, I also think about like someone like Andy Patterson, you know, he's older than me, um, and he shows up. <laughs> he does. You know, and it's like, that's good to know, like that one can live one's life by showing up. 
that's wonderful, <laughs> you know? Like, and in showing up, um, I see him have conversations with all sorts of people and th those people have conversations with him and he's such a walking encyclopedia. I mean, he's like an amazing, he's, he's, his brain is an archive. Uh, and he loves um, flipping the pages with you. Um, so I think having people like that in the scene is also helpful to kind of convey a certain ethos, you know, of like, oh, if someone opens up a space, whippersnapper, whatever, you should show up, <laughs> you know, like just for the fact that it's um, a new group of people keeping an old spirit going you know, in their own way, in their own f set of references. They may not even have any idea of about what the spirit that I'm talking about is, but they have their own spirit that they're talking about. But I recognize something in it, so I should show up. And I think for me, it's, it's not so much about generosity or it's not an act of kindness or anything like that. All of those things are fun. They're all good. But for me, it's just like showing up is... Is, is, is an interest. It's like you're doing your thing like I'm doing my thing and I want to know what your thing is, <laughs> you know? Just because I'm curious, right? You want to know what that is because it's not the same as mine. Um, and there's something to be l learned mutually uh, through that encounter. So... I do think it's like showing up, but out of a certain kind of need, a certain thirst for something, mm. you know? So I'm, I'm thirsty to know what the whippersnapper people are doing. I'm thirsty to know what you're doing. I'm thirsty to know what, what happens in the place where I live, because it's what happens in the place where I live. It's very simple in a certain sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is an ethos. I do think it's an ethos, and, and it's a bit of a counter ethos to a a social val value that says the, the new is the thing. And as soon as it's not new anymore, it's nothing. Um, that doesn't seem very helpful. <laughs> you know, this other ethos that I was talking about seems much more helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which it's funny because this conversation uh, is happening after the exhibition mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, to your point of the new and uh, that not being very helpful this conversation at all is kind of um, it's standing against mm. that idea in some ways it's it it this is just another plot on the trajectory of mm -hmm. of this project that we have mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. and will do together mm -hmm. um, and so and it's so fun. It's so nice to just riff with another person, especially because they have a different experience. Because that riff is the thing that kind of creates, that sparks those like pathways of thought that wouldn't have happened by yourself. Like it just wouldn't, you know? So, I mean, we were just talking in the break, like, we could do this kind of for hours, like yeah. we could, because it's so fun, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think if people understood how fun, what those kinds of fun experiences are like, um, there'd be a certain kind of hunger in, for them, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that the, the spark space is not guaranteed. You don't know where it'll lead. It may not produce anything, but it has its, its own reward. You know, if people knew that, um, I think people would be enjoying themselves a bit more. I agree. Yeah. And maybe that's a good spot to end on. Awesome. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, Parker. <laughs> nice.